Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Tom Ray and wildhistory.org, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. And it's our pleasure now to be joined by Tom Ray. Tom is the editor of wyohistory.org, a website that we are going to talk a lot about. Great. But Tom, right now, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thanks. Great to be here, Craig. It's really, I'm really pleased that you're with us, Tom. And before we really get into what wyohistory.org is, a fascinating website, mm -hmm. and it truly is for those of us with an interest in Wyoming. Let's talk a little bit about you. You were um, a young person who grew up in Pennsylvania but found right. yourself in Wyoming. Right. right, Pittsburgh, PA. I came to Wyoming in 1972 and again in 1973, right after I graduated from college, and uh, um, I fell in love and got married, went off to graduate school in Missoula for a few years, and we came back to Story, Wyoming in the 1980s where our children were small. And then um, in the late 80s, moved down to Casper to take a job at the Casper Star Tribune. And um, that was a great paper then. It's a great paper, and, and uh, that was a great education for me on, on how Wyoming works and how the world works. Yeah. What did you do at the Star? I was, did a lot of things. I was a couple different kinds of editors. I was the education reporter. I covered the legislature for a number of sessions. I later directed the legislature, legislative coverage, and I was city editor the last few years I was there. So. Um, so that was, uh, that was just a really, it was so really fun to be that work. I, I really I still kind of miss it. I miss the tension. I miss the arguments on deadline. I miss, I miss being able to have loud arguments with my code workers, wide open newsroom uh, in front of everybody else and, and have everybody go home at night and they all be fine the next day because we understood what we, what was, what we needed to argue about. And um, uh, then, I, then I left the paper and uh, went and, um, uh, wrote a few books about Wyoming history and started this website about seven years ago. So why did you start this site? <clears throat> this is what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. We're going to show our viewers throughout the broadcast mm -hmm. different parts of the website. Uh -huh. Was it a void that you noticed, Tom? Uh, it, it was. I Actually, it, it came out of some other work. I'd done some history writing work that I had done for the school district here. They had something, the Natrona County Schools had something called a Teaching American History Grant. And they commissioned me to write, oh, 20 some longish articles about events in Wyoming history that actually was meant to uh, fit in with um, a three disc uh, sh bunch of shows about Wyoming history that Wyoming PBS had done in this, the 1990s. What are those? Remind me. See, <laughs> DVDs, <laughs> I think uh -huh. they're called. Yeah. And so I kind of used that outline and was writing these um, these articles, and they were kind of aimed at future use, maybe by um, by students, high school, secondary students, junior high and high school students. And then uh, and then that um, that grant was over, and so I had we had all this content that I'd been paid for, and I thought, well, we should we should find a way to get this more available to people. And so uh, so I had some friends. Um, at the Wyoming State Historical Society, and we got together and, and they agreed, well, yeah, maybe we could do a state history website. The Wyoming State Historical Society is a private organization, which has been around since the early 1950s. It's a membership organization. It's got charter, it's got, uh, sorry, chapters in nearly every county in Wyoming, 1,500 members or so around the state and statewide. And, um, and they do a number of things to encourage the understanding of Wyoming history. They publish Annals of Wyoming, a quarterly magazine. They publish a great snappy little monthly newsletter. And, uh, and they run History Day in the schools for students around the state, another great program. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they were a natural uh, fit for this. And I said, well, let's see if we can do this. I think we can raise the money to do this. And there are a few other states that are doing a really good job of this, having state history websites. And here's some examples, and maybe we could aim for something of this quality. And, and um, so that's what we do. We now have hundreds and hundreds of articles about Wyoming history. We have a, 
a wide and steady audience, and uh, and we got emails from around the world <laughs> about Wyoming. Tom, this site really was brought to life in 2011. Right. That's right. Yes, I had a lot of content uh, that I had written about Wyoming history, longish articles that fit into an outline uh, of a of a three DVD set of about Wyoming history that that Deb Hammonds had produced for Wyoming PBS a long time ago, 15 years ago or more. And uh, so, um, so uh, we did a, I had done a number of, of articles about Wyoming history. We had all this content. Um, it didn't quite have a home. And so I approached the, uh, the State um, Historical Society about, about maybe starting a, a state history website. There are several uh, pretty good ones around the nation, um, state history websites, and I thought we could do one here too. And so we began development in 2010. Uh, we had some early and important support from the from the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund, and um, and by the spring of 2011, we were ready to go live. We were ready to go online. Um, the designer is a guy named Steve Foster from from Denver, who uh, for years worked for the Rocky Mountain News. He likes history. And really, the, the the physical look of the site and the navigability of the site uh, are all due to him. We and he's just a really uh, innovative and thoughtful guy. We're showing our viewers what this site looks like. Oh, good! And it is a handsome site. Good, yeah. I don't know how else to describe it. It yeah. looks good, uh -huh. but it is navigable. Uh -huh. um, it is fairly easy to find good. different things, and you have it organized fairly well. You have. Uh -huh. It's not just you, though, Tom. Right. Um, talk about the right. organization, if you will, right. of wildhistory.org. Right. So we have we hire writers for pretty modest fees uh, who write articles for us that we post on the site. We publish new content every month. The the steady staff is me and an assistant, part-time assistant editor in Laramie, um, Lori Van Pelt, and she is just she's great. How do you decide subject content? Um, People make us suggestions. I have stuff in the back of my mind that I've always wanted to get around to. Uh, sometimes emails coming out of the blue with ideas. Um, other stuff that I find that might be um, that that's already been developed other places. We're we're about to publish now an article on Earl Duran, the Tarzan of the Tetons, who uh, robbed a bank and and poached a deer and ended up died violently. Uh, in Hail of Bullets in Powell, Wyoming in 1939. Um, interesting stories like that, uh, but also um, stories about larger trends than that, inter interesting people and events in Wyoming's past. Uh, we also, I like to have great photos too. So, um, and because I love to look at old photos, any photos, but old photos, um, we, we have a lot of uh, interesting, good historic photos with pretty much every article, maps, Every article is located uh, on a Google map, you know, where the events of it incurred. And so, and then there's a sort of an index that's map based and yeah, all kinds of great stuff. You also take oral histories. We, we will take oral histories if they have a transcript to go with them so that they're searchable for anyone around the world looking for a certain topic. They can, you know, here's, here's a woman who grew up in the Bighorn Basin in the 1910s. Uh, you know, you, maybe you know her neighbors, and so you can search the transcript for a name if you're looking at something like that, which you couldn't do if there wasn't a transcript, as well as audio. For example, some years ago, the staff at the American Heritage Center in Laramie um, went over to um, Cokeville, Wyoming, on what must have been uh, the 25th anniversary of the Cokeville school bombing. Do you know about that event? Absolutely. And, and they interviewed... Uh, people who'd been children in those classrooms at the time, people who'd been emergency responders at the time, people who'd been parents who'd had children in that bu building when that man was holding all those children hostage. And they did, I don't know, a couple dozen um, or more interviews. And so we, uh, we commissioned an article on the event itself. And then at the same time, we're able to publish all these oral histories uh, and with transcripts and audio from all these people. Tom, as you... Um Look at what it is that you choose to write about. Right. What you vet, if you will. Right. Um, <clears throat> you're looking at original documents and right. sourcing and stuff. How do you make sure bias doesn't enter in to what wildhistory.org um, chooses to discuss? That's a that's a great question and something that's so much on people's minds these days. And I must say that uh, um, as a writer about the past myself, I do do a lot of research. I I try to keep in mind what I kept in mind when I was a news reporter, which is um, 
only one thing happened. And it's important to do your best to figure out what that was. So that means you have to find as many different angles on that thing that happened or, the, or um, that you can find. That's sort of your job. And to evaluate the reliability of sources. So that means if somebody says something, okay. Uh, did somebody else say something else? This person who said something, might he have had a reason that he's not mentioning for saying something? It's, it's a great, um, so that's what's so good I th about primary sources, by which we mean sources of information that come from something very close to the time of the event or uh, from a person maybe later who was actually at the event. So a diary, a photograph, a newspaper account, um, uh, those are all primary sources. Well, newspapers then and now can be wildly biased and so, and, and so can any of the rest of those. So your job is to bring a human understanding to it and to try to um, figure out what happened and that means you have to be skeptical about any source. Let's talk about that education component in yeah. just a moment. You say yeah. you're expanding. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, we're developing these, um, these I guess you'd call them products, uh, what that we call digital toolkits of Wyoming history. And so this is actually based on a model that's been developed at Stanford University. It's called, the, they're called the Stanford History Education Group. And I kind of got this idea from them. So what it does is it offers, it picks a topic, like, let's say, I was just working on one last week about the cattle boom in Wyoming in the 1880s, something that most kids learn about when they take Wyoming history. And so what we have to offer is um, uh, we have primary sources, um, maps and, and newspaper accounts of stuff that was going on at the time. We have a background article, which is probably usually our article, maybe one that we wrote and put up some years ago. And then we have uh, exercises uh, for the kids to do in the classroom after they read it and try to think about it and, and come up with a, um, you know, come up with a way to, for the kids to encounter the topic through the primary sources that come right out of the time. You're applying also energy towards the Indian Education for All. Right, right. Tell me about that. Well, actually, your organization, Wyoming PBS, last year in 2016, um, developed, uh, as, as, the, as this idea of, of a bill that would mandate or uh, would, would ask the State Department of Education to to rewrite or at least review its social study standards <clears throat> in a, to see if maybe more instruction uh, would be warranted uh, to Wyoming school children at all levels about uh, our, our neighbors on the Wind River Reservation. And um, so that turned out, that turned into the uh, leadership, into the, um, to the legislature's Indian Education for All bill, which was signed by the governor last March and which uh, directs the um, State Department of Education to review its standards, social study standards, uh, on this topic. And so now there's a committee that's doing that. And, um, but, but ahead of that, um, the Wyoming PBS was ahead of the curve in coming up with content that might be useful about, about uh, the Shoshone and Arapaho people in Wyoming um, uh, for classroom use. And so the PBS material includes some nice short like four to nine minute videos about the two different tribes and their history and also lesson plans developed by native educators uh, to go with those videos and so we thought there's a good model um, let's see if we could maybe do the same thing with wildhistory.org content so we have always since the beginning i've wanted to do more about the history of tribal people in wyoming than we've been able to do <clears throat> your favorite character give me your favorite character that i probably don't know about. do you know about bill carlisle i do not <laughs> Bill Carlisle was the last train robber of Wyoming. Uh, Bill Carlisle, um, Bill Carlisle was robbing trains along the Union Pacific and southern across the southern tier in the 1916 and 18. Um, with a, he'd get he was a gentleman bandit. He was called. He would never rob from women. If uh, if this was during World War One, if there was a soldier in uniform, he would never rob the soldier. He would only rob people, and he was a he was a guy who was kind of down on his luck and needed a way out. He robbed trains two or three times. Uh, he was sent to he was captured. The other was 
he was captured and sent to prison in, in Rollins. Uh, one of those times he escaped. The story is that he escaped in a shirt box. So I don't know if that means a laundry box, you know, big, big bunk, shirt anyway. Box. Yeah, big shirt, <laughs> he was a little guy. And, uh, <clears throat> um, and then they captured him again. There's a big manhunt and posse and stagecoaches. He was holding up in a ranch up near Douglas finally when they caught him the last time, I think. Went back to prison. Uh, spent about 20 years in prison, got out in the 1930s. And while he was in prison, he had, uh, he encountered uh, this preacher who turned him, turned him around and, and uh, he came out of prison and um, had a trailer court, or not a, um, a tourist court, a little motel outside of Laramie. A friend of mine's father worked for him when my friend's father came back from World War II, 18, 19, 19 or 20 years old, coming back to the university. University of Wyoming after he'd been in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, anyway, he worked for um, Bill Carlisle, and, uh, but, and then Bill Carlisle, sometime along in there in the late 1940s, wrote a book, which I just found a copy of the other day at a, at a bookstore in Sheridan when I was up there on Saturday, um, Bill Carlisle, Lone Bandit. But anyway, it's a, it's a Autobiography? Yes, it's an mm -hmm. autobiography. Mm -hmm. Yep. Along the same vein, if you gave me one book to read and yeah. only one book yeah. to read if I were very interested in the history of Wyoming. Yeah. And I only had one book on my list to fit my time yeah. this year. What do you what are you bringing to me? Yeah, I was I would recommend a book called Rising from the Plains by John McPhee. Um, McPhee is a is a great nonfiction writer um, who's still writing books. Uh, he he's he's one of those writers who I guess you would call it uh, New journalism, or and anyway, he's a great. He writes on a, uh, all kinds of different topics, whatever is of interest to him, and um, and he's good at tying uh, the individuals that he writes about into into that background, into into the context of where they're from. So that book was published in the mid or late 1980s. Uh, its center figure is David Love, who was a longtime geologist with the with the universe with the US Geological Survey had an had an office forever and ever on the University of Wyoming campus uh, Dave Love grew up on Muskrat Creek south of Manita Wyoming not you know sort of eastern Fremont County mm -hmm. just about the geographical center of Wyoming and uh, and Dave Love's mother Ethel Waxham Love came to Wyoming from the east as a young school teacher uh, and was teaching in this um, one-room schoolhouse out there uh, on Muskrat Creek, and she met this sheep herder, this Scottish sheep herder named John Love, and and they got married and raised a bunch of boys out there, and um, and girls, and uh, and so McPhee uses Dave Love's tales about Wyoming geology. He uses actual Wyoming geology. Love figured out some of the most complicated geology in Wyoming, especially in particular the geology of Jackson Hole. It was Dave Love who figured that out um, and mapped and did geology all over Wyoming in the West. And, 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 and McPhee alternates that career and that man with this amazing story of his mother, the school teacher, because she kept a really vivid journal and wrote a lot of letters. And so she was a wonderful writer herself. And, uh, and so the book does both those things. So it has that kind of, the thing I like, I like to, I've written some books that have a lot of geology in them too. And the thing that geology is always the most uh, um, available to me kind of science because it's all in time order. You know, those rocks are in layers according to when they were laid down. So of all the sciences, geology is the one to me that seems the most like reading a book in order of what happened. And, and this book has that quality, too, of this, this orderly sense of time and all of it being available at once. I want to back up towards education for just a moment. Do yeah. you have a sense that Wyoming students, K through 12 I'm speaking of, yeah. have the understanding and appreciation for Wyoming history that you would like to see as someone who impacts social studies standards, yeah. for example? Yeah. What do you, how do, how's our school districts doing relative to Wyoming history? Um, I'm hoping that with these products, uh, we can offer teachers something that is um, easy <clears throat> to use. Uh, um, any teacher's job is to meet any, is not to complain about what a kid 
doesn't know, any teacher's job, and they all know this, is to, is to meet the kid where he is and work like hell not to leave him there. And so, um, so that means if they have tools that are easily available, then they can do it. It's not like it was when you and I were in school that uh, your teacher stands up there and tells you what's up and you write the notes and it's on the quiz on Friday. It's just not like that. That's not really, that, that model was missing a whole lot of people. And so these teachers I know now, they're doing all other kinds of stuff and using their time differently and using their resources differently. And we want to have something that they can, um, they can easily pluck off and use whenever they need Tom, it. Tom, in understanding how your site's used uh -huh. and understand how history is taught, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you participate in developing standards for social studies. Do Wyoming kids today have um, a good understanding of Wyoming history in your view? Um, I don't know. I'm not a teacher. I'm not in the classroom. Um, I'm, I, do, I do want to, uh, to make history available, and I want, it, I want it to be in tools that are useful to teachers and students both. Um, and that means uh, electronic, and that means easily available and usable, and not too big. So that uh, I want these, these um, I guess you could call them lesson plans that we're developing. Uh, we were at a conference with some teachers uh, a, a last spring, and and one of them said to us, don't give me uh, a lesson plan that I have to take three or five days out of my semester to teach. Give me something uh, that I can take off a shelf on a Friday afternoon when a group of three or five kids over here is done with some work and, they, and, I, and they're really interested in a topic and, or just in history in general, and I can just <clears throat> say, go do this, um, so that, it, that it's flexible, um, that it's available, and that it's high quality. It's not, not to waste their time, quite mm -hmm. the opposite. It's, mm -hmm. to, it's to lead them somewhere they might not go somewhere, somewhere else. So as we develop these tools, I hope to be offering them, you know, there are a dozen or so teachers around the state who know what we're doing and who, as we get these developed, will, I hope, be trying them out and letting us know what works and what doesn't. Libraries today. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Been, are used differently. Yes, yeah, they are used differently. And you can yeah. help. Yeah. Yes, I hope. I hope also that because of uh, all these articles we have that have these that have these bibliographies at the end, there's a lot of books listed there, and I hope people will go to libraries because when you are researching a topic, really researching a topic, there's still something that's available by browsing library shelves that I do not think uh, uh, internet browsing is a different thing. So um, when I'm looking for a specific book up here at the Casper College Library for, a, for something I'm researching to write about. I go up there and I get the book, but when I find the book on the shelf, here to the left five books and here to the right five books um, are you know 10 other books on related topics that I would never have known about. There's no other way that I can understand for me to have known about what those were until I see them on the shelf. And so I, I found this last uh, big project I was working on, one of the books that became one of the main three sources I was using for this large project was, I found it that way. And so, um, so I don't quite know how you replace that, although I think there's other kinds of browsing online that will make all kinds of stuff available that libraries don't have too. So. Tom, as us old timers start yeah. to ride away into the yeah. western sunset, are, you, are there <laughs> yeah. enough people who are interested in Wyoming history to, to, to pick up in your view, to, to assist and to carry forward? That's a great question, and one we don't ask ourselves often enough. I do think that the Wyoming State Historical Society is, um, is, a, is, a, is a thriving organization um, with a lot of new um, uh, young people coming up through its, through its executive committee, through its board, and, 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 uh, and its new chairman now is and, uh, are very interested in, in developing uh, programs for young people. So I think that'll help to keep that that organization vital into the future, and I hope with it um, the website too. So now what's the vision from now on? What does whilehistory.org still need to do or still want to do? Yeah, well, I, I want to just keep off. We're never going to run out of uh, out of um, topics. Uh, we're never going to run. There's never going to be. <laughs> Wyoming history is never going to be all written by any means. Um, and at the same time, I also really want to make um, really high quality tools available for for the schools um, as a way to so that children going forward can um, learn more about their past. I think it makes you a better thinker, a better citizen um, uh, in here in the Wyoming and the West. And huh? goodness knows we have a lot to figure out. Just have a minute or so left. You have a field trip section. 
Yeah, we do have a on whilehistory.org. Yeah. Explain yeah. that. We're showing that to our viewers here. Oh, yeah, great. Right, yeah, well, with nearly every um, article that we publish, we also have at the end field trip suggestions, places you can go in Wyoming um, to, visit, to visit places where something happened that's been mentioned in this article you've just read. So those are often museums and historic sites, and we have a little map that locates it, and we have uh, information <coughs> if it's a museum or a site, what the hours are and how you can find out more about it. And I should point out, these are not two-day travel destinations, this might be something across the street right, right. or just on the other side of right, town. Right, right. And, and there's a map you can bring up with the whole state with all the field trips located on it. It's interactive. You can click on the dots and it'll tell you more. And so if you're planning a drive around the state, um, you know, look at that map and you can, if you like history in your family, you know, and I, when my kids were little, oh, Dad, do we have to stop at another historical marker? Yes, we do. And so, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of families like that. And, and so, uh, and there can never be too many. And so I think this is a nice way to find out what might be along your way as you're driving. Well, Tom, we urge people to go take a look Great. at whilehistory.org. We wish you well in Thank your continuing success you. with the website. Thanks so much for your it's a It's a treasure for the state of Wyoming. Great. It truly is. Great. Thanks for joining you're us welcome. on Wyoming Chronicle. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Craig.